the head of the Of 
services for HIV treatment to be increased and more preventive measures taken. When age data shows that four decades into the HIV response, inequality is still persist for the most basic services such as testing, treatment, and condom use, and even more so, new technologies. The greatest inequalities are in the developing nations with growing populations. With eight years remaining before the 2030 goal of ending AIDS as a global health threat, UNAID says economic, social, cultural, and legal inequalities must be addressed again. UNAID says young women in Africa remain disproportionately affected by HIV while it dedicated programs for them in too low. East Africa is one of the regions with the infection rate. One of the countries in the region is Africa's newest nation, South Sudan, where Dr. Kanye Modi, the country's Minister of Health, pushed for better testing and the treatment for HIV AIDS. The other thing the data they have to remove, these persons who are put on treatment early will not the search of things. And if they stop taking the medication, body is made to the misconception in some countries in Africa that HIV is not real. HIV is real, you may be the last to be infected if you don't prevent it. So what has helped for me to be preventing it? It has known our status. So that we can be able to eradicate HIV by 2030. Dr. Ashel Ayom, Deputy Chairperson of HIV AIDS Commission in South Sudan, says a rising number of infections there is not because people know about AIDS. These young kids know about HIV. They use condoms. Young ones, they know to use condoms. Women, they don't go and test. Because they are said to be divorced or be seen by a husband. The World Health Organization says globally more than 38 million people are living with HIV AIDS. Nearly 26 million of them are in Africa. So, we are Japanese and James Shimanu in Nairobi, Kenya. You're listening to VOA's International. And I'm here, yes, we're here to see Washington. The World Cup News, Group A and B, have decided in a striking fashion that the World Cup on Tuesday. We have always on goal sports analyst, Mark Media Mano, to fill us on Wednesday's exciting highlights. Our uh, hey, is in Austria to beat Denmark 1-0 to advance to the next round in another upset. France lost.
because it means I'm going to grab it. And no feel what teams are coming up tomorrow and what implications do you have for the teams? Our goal is tomorrow to Croatia plays Belgium and Morocco plays Canada. At the moment, Croatia is at the top of that group with Morocco in second, but both teams have the exact same points. Four points. So Croatia is up because of Morocco. Such an important thing that a, a lot of people, uh, fans that are watching, might not understand. When you saw Spain score seven zero against Costa Rica, that allowed them to have that big margin for goal scored and that goal differential. Right? Also, if Croatia and Morocco both win, they advance. Canada is eliminated because they haven't gained any points in the group yet. Honestly, tied Morocco, they will win enough to qualify. But Belgium. And if Morocco is to lose to Canada, they can also embark. Very, very exciting, exciting information. Also, in Group E, Japan plays Spain and Costa Rica plays Germany. As it said, now Spain is at the top of that group with four points, and Japan and Costa Rica both have three points, with Germany at the bottom with one point. Remember, Germany lost that initial first game to Japan. So, uh, trying to make it up and trying to get back. Luckily for them, group is very much well divided and no team is completely out of here. Um, there are a lot of different scenarios where all these teams can make it, but the best case scenario, as they say, is for you to go out there and get that win and see how everything else is going to pan out for you. But you need to go for that win. I'm, I'm just honestly super excited about the next phase of this, uh, of this tournament. This version, like I said, are kind of the next time phase. It, it, it's going to be something different. Yes, things are definitely heating up. VOA uh, on Gold Sports Analyst, Mopilia Pano, thank you again for your influence. Thank you for my case. Forty greetings. This is VOA Sunny Young. Government. At the recent U.S. 
U.S. German Futures Forum, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and German Foreign Minister Alain Lena Beirbel participated in a conversation on the values of a democratic society in an increasingly digitalized world. Both agreed, as Secretary Blinken stated, that technology either advances our democracies or undermines them, and that the only hope of accomplishing the former is by like-minded countries working together. The post-Cold War era is over, said Secretary Blinken. There is a competition on how to shape what comes next, and technology is at the heart of that competition. It is going to mutual economy, uh, reform our military, and going to really reshape our lives. The United States and Germany together have a positive, affirmative vision for what that reshaping looks like, he said. It's about finding a way to do the deal. It's about making technology to make sure that we can actually deal with climate change. Uh, it's about using technology to make sure that we can have uh, our societies and economies in ways that don't rely on fossil fuels. It's about making sure that we have sustainable, healthy supplies of home uh, around the world. The technology can also be profoundly misused against people, said Secretary Blinken. To uh, undermine their privacy, to reduce their human rights, to harass people uh, online, particularly women and minorities. Uh, and to prepare people for uh, misinformation, disinformation, which is a long process. I think it's the most explosive thing to any democracy. And of course, there are profound questions of security. No single country can meet these challenges alone, Secretary Blinken said. Cooperation and coordination are needed. Most importantly, in setting standards and refusing democratic values in the technological and digital space. In creating his words from high to the top, not to the bottom, when it comes to the way technology is deployed. Secretary Blinken noted that the U.S. German Futures Forum took place in the city of Winster, which was part of the famous Transatlantic League, founded in the 14th century. The league was an effort to create trading groups throughout Europe, connecting people, connecting products, connecting ideas, and at its best, a thing for what the digital world is about, Secretary Blinken said. Technology is either inherently good or bad. What we make of it is, and that's our challenge together. That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. Demonstrators called for leader Xi Jinping to resign. 
the statement did not provide additional details on exact enforcement measures that would change. During the pandemic, Twitter established several measures aimed at helping users learn more about COVID-19. It also worked efforts to prevent misleading information from appearing on the service. The efforts included banning some users who repeatedly published material on COVID-19 identified as misinformation. Other social media services established similar measures. They included Facebook parent Meta and Alphabet-owned YouTube. Twitter's announced policy change was praised by some people and criticized by others. Some public health officials warned the change could bring more false claims about COVID-19. They said it could lead to increased material claiming vaccines to fight the virus are ineffective or unsafe. Bad news, tweeted public health scientist Eric Feigelbein about the latest change at Twitter under Musk. However, Feigelbein urged people not to flee Twitter. Stay, folks. Do not feed and square to them, he tweeted. Musk has described himself as a free speech absolutist who is seeking to make Twitter available to people with widely different opinions. He has described earlier Twitter laws that sought to limit misinformation and hate speech as forms of censorship. Soon after the new announcement, some Twitter users tested the new lack of enforcement and celebrated the service's latest hands-off rule. Simone Gold is a doctor who created and leads the organization America's Frontline Doctors. Gold and her group have criticized Twitter and other social media companies. Gold tweeted, This policy was used to silence people across the world who questioned the media narrative surrounding the virus and treatment options. She declared Twitter's latest announcement a win for free speech and medical freedom. Paul Russo is a social media researcher and administrator at the Katz School of Science and Health at Yeshiva University in New York. He told the Associated Press that Twitter's past efforts to stop that claims of COVID-19 were not perfect. However, he said the company's decision to end enforcement of its current misinformation policy represents a disservice to Twitter users. It is 100% the responsibility of the platform to protect its users from harmful content, Russo said. Russo added that the decision is the latest in a series of moves that will likely lead more users and advertisers to leave Twitter. Several big businesses have stopped advertising on Twitter over questions about its direction under Musk. Joel Roth is the former head of trust and safety of Twitter who lost after Musk took over. When asked about Twitter's latest move, Roth said he was concerned about how many employees were left to moderate published material. Musk reportedly dismissed half of Twitter's employees shortly after taking over. Roth said it is difficult to know how many moderators are currently working at Twitter to identify and remove material that violates company policies. I couldn't tell you, he said when asked to offer an estimate. 
lost odor, but part of the problem was that a company-wide listing of employees was turned off immediately after a takeover. It was that chaotic, he said. I'm Brian Lynch. talk a bit more about the technology report you just heard. Welcome back, Brian. Hello, Ashley. Glad to be here. In today's report, we learned Twitter is no longer enforcing a policy aimed at limiting misinformation about COVID-19. In the story, you bring up the issue of content moderation. Moderation is a term that seems to come up a lot in stories about social media companies. Can you explain how moderation is used here and also look at some other uses of the word? Sure, Ashley. The definition we use in this story for moderation is a process that makes sure the rules of an internet discussion are not broken. Since social media companies have restrictions on certain kinds of content, they would use this process to make sure that no rules are being violated. And often when violations are found, content moderators, a noun form of the word, immediately remove banned material. And it can also be a verb to moderate something. Correct? Exactly right. When the moderators are doing their jobs, they are moderating content. And it is interesting, too, that moderate can also be used as an adjective with a completely different meaning. And for this usage, it is pronounced moderate. And in this case, the word is used to describe things that are average in size or amount. Thanks again, Brian, for joining me and for sharing some thoughts on word usage with our listeners. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children that is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English by asking and answering questions in experiencing some situations. For more information, visit our website learningenglish.coaway.com. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VRO Special English. Early in 1857, the United States Supreme Court announced one of its most important rulings. The High Court decided the case of a slave named Dred Scott. Harry Neal and Leo Scully tell us about the ruling and the continuing national debate over slavery. Dred Scott lived in Missouri, where slavery was legal. Then he was sold to a man who took him to Illinois and Wisconsin, where slavery was not legal. After four years, he was returned to Missouri. Dred Scott demanded his freedom because of the years he had spent in places where slavery was illegal. Congress had banned slavery in those places under the Missouri Compromise Act of 1820. The Supreme Court ruled that Congress did not have the power to close territories to slavery said the Missouri Compromise was a violation of the United States Constitution, and that Dred Scott was not a free man. James Buchanan was sworn in as president at the time of the Dred Scott case. 
Buchanan believed the Supreme Court's decision would put an end to the dispute over slavery. He believed that Americans, North and South, would accept the decision as the final word in the dispute. This did not happen. The Dred Scott decision did not calm the storm that divided the nation. Instead, it increased its fury. New trouble threatened to break out in the territory of Kansas between pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers. In the past few years, the two sides had argued and fought over their opinions. They even had formed two separate governments. The pro-slavery forces controlled the legal government. The anti-slavery forces controlled an opposition government which had no power. Supporters of slavery wanted to organize a constitutional convention that could put Kansas into the Union as a slave state. The pro-slavery legislature passed a bill calling for such a convention. The bill gave supporters of slavery every chance to control the election of delegates to the convention. And it gave the convention complete freedom to make its own rules. The bill provided no way for the people of Kansas to vote on their own constitution. The governor of the Kansas Territory, John Geary, vetoed the bill. But the legislature quickly overruled his veto. Pro-slavery men called for Geary to get out of Kansas. Some thought of shooting him if he did not leave. Governor Geary had been living under extreme tension for months. He had worked hard to keep Kansas peaceful. He was angry because he could get no help from the federal government. He sent his resignation to President Buchanan. Then the former governor spoke publicly. He said most of the settlers in Kansas were peace-loving people. He said only a small group was responsible for the trouble there. Geary said a few powerful men hoped to make Kansas a slave state. If this failed, Geary said, they hoped their actions would produce civil war. President Buchanan appointed a new governor for Kansas. Buchanan told him that slavery in the territory must be decided on the votes of the people of the territory. And he said the people must be given a fair chance 